Okay, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be in this room and to meet colleagues that I have only met online and worked with in the last three years to finally be here in person. So my name is Lena. Um, I am here to share with you my thinking on micro-credential design um, from a competency perspective, and then a little bit about the capacity building um, efforts we need to do in order to get there. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. So I'm from Toronto. This is a picture of the Toronto skyline. Um, Toronto is in the province of Ontario. It was nice to see Ontario's policy work recognized in the last presentation. Um, and I want to just note that um, my lens on this conversation is, of course, Canadian. So it's oriented in that direction. Um, but it's also oriented towards the educational experience of a micro-credential. So I work at a higher education institution. And so I'm very interested in what is actually inside the micro-credential offering. Uh, so not necessarily on the digital aspects, but connected and the networks and the systems and the wallets and all those sorts of things. But what is the actual experience like? Um, to the point earlier about focus and target audience, we are focused on lifelong learning and our target audience is adults. So remember that kind of as, as I'm going through um, because that, that's what frames my thinking. So I have one question um, that I think about a lot uh, in this work and that I think is an important question when we're, when, we're, when we're framing this conversation. And that question is this, how is a micro-credential experience different? And there is an assumption in this question. And that assumption is that we would not have created an entirely new category of education or educational credential if we were feeling as though the existing experiences that we were creating were meeting the needs we were seeing out there. Oh, sorry. So there's one thing about this uh, that I want you to keep in mind as well, in addition to that question, and that is familiarity bias. So a lot of the times we make decisions um, about how to build educational experiences based on what we know, based on what we experienced as learners, right? So our educational experiences have a particular rhythm, they have a particular feel, they present in a particular way. And I'm very interested in questioning um, those norms so that we can begin to understand um, how a micro credential experience might be different. So quick story um, before we get into it. And this is a story that I don't know many of you might be familiar with, um, but I was a hiring manager one time for an entry level position. Has anyone ever been in that situation? You get a stack, like a huge stack of resumes, right? Sometimes thousands. <clears throat> and I had one. I always look at them all because I'm interested in them as an artifact because <laughs> uh, I think they're pretty, pretty useless. But um, I was I was looking at this one and um, and it had it listed all the courses that this person had ever taken. And they actually included the course codes, which I also thought was particularly um, interesting because as a hiring manager, I'm looking at this list and it is, you know, it is not the information you need. Right, uh, a course code's like C D, you know F J, six eighty, intro to whatever, um, and really that experience just left me feeling pretty sad because here was an individual who was trying, doing the best that they could, right, to show me and tell me about what they were capable of, and it was not working. So is this a question of translation? Because I, I used to think it was, right? That we could just translate that information into the language of performance, the language of ability, the language of capability. Um, I used to think that was true, but I've been questioning that a little bit lately. Because traditional higher education is about intellectual expansion through depth and breadth. Right, that's really important. There are very, very important reasons for that. Micro-credentials, which is why I'm interested in this conversation, have a different purpose, I would argue, which is precision through acquisition or validation. So can we use the design principles of the first 
focus to apply to the second. And I see this, this says common approaches, by the way. <laughs> I see this problem a lot. Um, I see our, our, our confusion on that last question I just posed a lot in some of the common approaches we're taking to micro-credentialing. So what do they look like? This is, and this is from a Canadian perspective, right? So this is what I'm seeing in my context. They look like deconstructed programs. And this was mentioned in William's um, presentation as well, right? Take an existing program, chop it up, attach a digital credential to each element, call those micro-credentials. That, I mean, this that's not a bad idea, right? That could help a lot of people. A lot of people want to pursue a full program, but don't have time and need to be able to do it in smaller pieces. A worthwhile goal. But is that solving the resume story problem? This says knowledge tests. This is the other, this is the other thing I see a lot. Um, a lot of people focusing on assessment. We know assessment is really important. Um, it's more part of the quality principles that were shared before. Uh, but what kind of assessment, right? Um, in our corporate landscape in Canada, I see a lot of gr great organizations kind of working on micro-credentials and, and they know assessment is really important because they care about that, right? But they're testing in a very particular way. They're testing in a way that they understand and that they know and that they think is a test, right? Which is probably a hundred question multiple choice exam. So the way a lot of our uh, professional licensing is done as well. So is that solving our resume problem? Maybe, partly. But I still have this question, right? How is a micro-credential experience different? What is it, how does it look, feel? Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we're doing and how we're thinking about that. So in my context, in my institution that I work in, Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson University, we just went through a name change. Um, the difference maker is assessed competency. So assessed competency, let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, we, we care about this so much that we actually put it into our institutional policy. Uh, and we said, one micro-credential offering, again, offering, not artifact, right? The artifact is like the, the thing you get at the end, different, different conversation. The offering, one offering is one assessed competency. So what is a competency? We'll get to that. But I think that this approach really gets us closer to this potential, right? This idea of micro-credentials as about precision through acquisition or validation. So what is competency? Competency is the specific and measurable combination of knowledge, skills, and attributes. So three components there that result in the performance of an activity or task to a defined level of expectation or standard. But the key words are knowledge, skills, and attributes, performance of an activity or task. So this is my favorite example of competency because it's one that we all probably have experienced, although I don't even, I'm not even a licensed, I don't drive. <laughs> I live in the city, I've always lived in the city, I walk everywhere, I bike. Um, but I did learn to drive at one point in time and, and I don't know uh, what it's like uh, where you're from, but uh, I grew up in Vancouver, which is in British Columbia, so it's on the other side of Canada. And um, there's three stages to your, knowledge, to your learning how to drive, right? The first thing you do is you take a knowledge test. You have to go in and you have to prove that you know the rules of the road, right? You have to prove you know the difference between a red light and a green light. You have to prove that you know what the speed limit is in a school zone. That you know what cyclists are, you know? You need, to, you, need to, you need to prove that you know all that stuff. And usually you go in and you do a written test, right? And it's usually multiple choice. Mine was digital, I guess. I grew up in the, in the 2000s. So you get the, the digital test. And then you get your first stage of your driving test. And then you, they're like, okay, you can practice. So you can go out there and you can practice, but you need to have a licensed driver with you, right? So at that point, you are honing your skills. So you've, you've proved that you have the baseline knowledge. You get in the car and you've got to learn, you've got to prove that you can operate the vehicle, right? So in my case, I was driving standard uh, truck. <laughs> so not very, for a 16-year-old for a girl, driving a standard truck in the city is, is pretty, 
difficult. But anyways, you have to you have to learn you have to prove you can operate the clutch, right? Don't grind the gears. You're developing your skills. Then you get your driving test where someone is sitting with you in the vehicle assessing your performance of the combination of your knowledge and your skills in a particular context, right? Which is driving and wherever you're getting licensed to drive. That's a competency, right? A combination of knowledge, skills, and attributes, if you like, you know, if you attributes meaning values or ways of holding yourself. So you're not, you know, getting angry at someone for cutting you off, that kind of thing. You might fail for that. Okay, so that's competency. So that's what I'm talking about. So it's the difference between this. This is a question we ask uh, to work with our subject matter experts a lot. It's like you go from what do you know to what can you do with the knowledge and skills that you have. So that's what I think makes a micro-credential experience different. So when we say, when I say that a uh, competency is at the heart of every micro-credential, I literally mean that that's the only thing that we define it by. Whatever else surrounds it in terms of the experience, we are agnostic about and depends on what we're trying to do. But it is an assessed competency. It's at the heart of everything. And I, what I'm proposing is that if we take this approach, we're not asking our learners to translate anymore, but we are actually providing them with the language of ability that is instantly recognizable in the workplace context. So we are building that bridge. We're connecting those two points. We're not asking them to try and do it for us, right? So from an education, educational institution uh, perspective, when you're focused on lifelong learning and you're serving adult learners who are already out there, right? They're already in the world. If you try and make them come back to the world of traditional education, they look at you like, what are you talking about? Don't make me do this, right? So we're not asking them to do that. We're we are going into their spaces and bringing those back into our educational design. So a competency-based assessment means proof of ability because it, if, it, if it is performed by a reputable institution to quality standards, then that means proof, right? So from an employer perspective, that replaces the occupational test. Is anyone, anyone else done uh, other than trying to hire for an entry-level position looking at the stack of resumes? You might have also created an occupational test every, every once in a while if you have the time <laughs> and the energy, right? You, you do something, you create some sort of scenario that you give to the candidate to see whether they can function at the level you need them to function at, right? Employers spend a lot of time and energy doing this. So what I'm suggesting is that we do it for them. So how does this impact design? Huge, big implications, right, for um, what it looks like when you're trying to design in an educational environment to this standard. A couple of things that come to mind, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. But the first is this. Emphasis shifts away from content towards assessment. So it is no longer about how much content or how do we organize the content. And we tend, we take a backwards design approach. So rather than kind of building up all of the modules and then saying, okay, oh yeah, we have to tack an assessment onto the end, we start with the assessment. And that takes a lot of time to design a good competency-based assessment. So it's not a small thing, um, but we flip, we basically flip the design process. The second is that authentic and situational competency-based assessment design becomes really important because it's not easy to do. Um, and if you've ever created an occupational test, you know, like it, it takes some time to do a good one. It takes some time. Um, so who does that within our institutions and how do they build up the skills and ability to do that? And then finally, the role of the instructor. This is this is um, this is not a small one either. And it and it is um, super confusing for a lot of uh, the traditional instructors that we have in our spaces. Um, so we actually tend to work with instructors who are practitioners first. Um, but the role of the instructor shifts to an expert assessor and mentor. So they're no longer facilitating the journey of the individual through the content. 
That's for a different purpose, right? This is about, okay, prove to me what you can do. And then the feedback that they get about how they did, did they meet that threshold of mastery? What does competence look like in this context? That is, that is complex. And the feedback that you get from your expert is hugely important because whether you pass or not, sometimes it doesn't even really matter, right? Well, it does matter if you are trying to do something that you need a credential for. But oftentimes what we're doing with these competency-based assessments is just revealing to the individual, you know, you're falling short in these couple of areas and they know exactly where they have to go back and fill the gaps. What capacity is needed in our institutions in order to do those kind of three big shifts that I talked about? Um, we need educational leaders that invest in experimentation. Uh, so you need to be able to create spaces in your institutions that say, okay, go for it, try this. Um, don't worry if it doesn't work the first couple of times you do it. We need expertise in competency-based assessment. Uh, and we need tools and technologies that enable assessment to take place asynchronously and at scale. So that is kind of the down the road thing. Um, the, ver the prototypes that we're building right now are, are labor intensive, um, but we have plans to scale them. So we're designing them in such a way that allows us to, um, to be able to scale them in the future, but we are still in the process of identifying the tools and the technologies that will allow us to do that effectively and still maintain the quality components, the experience components, and of course, the academic integrity components. So these are the questions that I, that I put together. I don't know, you can answer these ones or ask these ones of yourself if you want, um, but I'm really interested to know from your perspective, um, because I started out with a big assumption at the beginning, which is that an, a micro-credential experience is actually or should actually be different. So do you think that's true? Uh, if yes, why? If no, why? Um, and if yes, how are the micro-credential offerings that you're producing, or even that you envision, they might not exist yet, um, how do they offer a different experience for the learner? Uh, and then, and then have a little bit about the competency-based approach, which I think is um, you know, very active in the US, uh, a little bit active in Canada, um, uh, but might um, might be something that um, we're encountering for the first time, or maybe not. I'd be really interested to know. So what do you think about that? And um, what are some of the opportunities, limitations? 